Welcome back to Black Hat. Our program will commence shortly with some opening remarks from Jeff Moss, followed by our keynote speaker, Daniel Gruss. Black Hat would not be possible without the support of so many people, especially this year as we've been all been impacted by the global pandemic and have had to rethink our entire event in a virtual format. I would like to thank our sustaining sponsors, our global sponsors, and of course, all of our Black Hat Asia sponsors for their ongoing support. I encourage you to connect with them in the business hall and to explore the many free resources they have provided. I encourage you to attend their sessions, which are open to all attendees. To our Black Hat review boards for trainings, briefings, our executive program and arsenal, we thank you for your tireless efforts in building the program for this week. Thank you to all of our speakers for their eagerness to embrace the online format. Some housekeeping before we begin. Be sure to download your copy of Cyber Threats in Turbulent Times, a report just published from the annual Black Hat Attendee Survey. The survey and report were developed by our colleagues at Dark Reading and is available to download in the Dark Reading booth, which is within the business hall. If you would like more market research, I invite you to visit Omdia, our newly rebranded research and consulting business who are also available in the business hall. As we kick off today's program, I would like to thank you for attending Black Hat this year and remind you that the same content will be available to you for 30 days after the event. We encourage you to come back and revisit the content at your own pace. And now it is my pleasure to welcome back to the stage, the dark tangent, Jeff Moss. Welcome back to day two of Black Hat Asia, Singapore, first virtual event. And it's my privilege to introduce the day two keynote speaker. Mr. Daniel Graus, an assistant professor at Graz University of Technology, who finished his PhD in only three years. He's been involved in teaching operating system security to undergraduate courses since 2010. Most recently, Daniel's work has gained international attention uh, through his research focus on side channels and transient execution attacks. He was involved in the team that implemented the first remote fault attack running on a website now famously known as rowhammer.js, and his research team was one that found the meltdown in Spectre bugs published in 2018. These kinds of deep technical faults in the way that hardware operates is fundamentally changing the way that we view CPUs, remote hosting, and bare metal architectures. And so I'm really looking forward to seeing what he has on the horizon and thoughts he has on hardware security. Hello and welcome to today's keynote. I will talk about uh, how complexity killed security. Uh, my name is Daniel Gruß. I'm an assistant professor at Graz University of Technology. So let's start with a simple comic from XKCD. So in this comic, uh, you probably know this is your situation. Are you coming to bed? I can't. This is important. What? Someone is wrong on the internet. And I thought maybe we start with some case like that. So, this is a comic from XKCD as well. The Meltdown Inspector exploits use speculative execution. What's that? You know the trolley problem? Well, for a while now, CPUs have basically been sending trolleys down both passes, quantum style, while awaiting your choice. Then the unneeded phantom trolley disappears. If we take a look at how Spectre actually works, you will see that the processor just makes a prediction, as you can see here, and then walks down that path. It doesn't walk down both paths. And then if the speculation was incorrect, of course, it will first walk the one way and then walk the other way um, if it had to readapt this speculation. Okay, so this is not actually uh, fully correct, but let's take a look at the second part. Uh, the phantom trolley isn't supposed to touch anyone, uh, but uh, it turns out you can still use it to do stuff and it can drive through walls. Also there, this is a reference to Meltdown. Um, Meltdown and Spectre are separate attacks, but I will get to that also later as well. Uh, that sounds bad. Honestly, I've been assuming we were doomed since we learned about Rowhammer. Uh, so what's that? Well, in Rowhammer, you um, access rows and if you access them often enough, then you will find bit flips in the middle row. So you modify memory without actually accessing these memory cells and you don't have permission to access them, which allows you to implement very interesting attacks. It sounds interesting to me. Do we just suck at computers? 
Yeah, especially shared ones. So uh, here's also my conclusion that I want to start with. Uh, computers were a mistake. Uh, we are all doomed and we don't even know what we are doing. So let's take a look at how we got there and what the situation actually is. In this uh, picture, we see an illustration of uh, the modern internet, how it is connected as a fully uh, connected graph of uh, servers. The complexity of this is so enormous that we are getting into a scale that is almost of biological measures. Um, if we take a look at uh, this uh, comic again, uh, if we software developers, but also hardware developers, were um, architects, probably we would try to build buildings like this. The thing is we are putting layers on top of layers on top of layers that depend on each other and that make assumptions about each other, but it's not really clear whether these assumptions always hold. Uh, you probably will also know, and you will probably have experienced this, how complexity exceeds our um, thought capacity very quickly and very easily. Um, my code doesn't work, I have no idea why, and vice versa, my code works, I have no idea why. And it takes us quite some time until we understand why the code works. So it's very easy to build complex things that uh, at first are very difficult for us to understand ourselves. Let's take a look at uh, one example. So this is a DRAM module. And these DRAM modules, they have these chips, banks, uh, rows, they have um, channels, ranks. And if you uh, take a look at how this mapping works from physical addresses to the actual hardware cells, um, that's not documented, right? It's not public. But we reverse engineered that and that was uh, four years ago and we resolved these functions for several different machines. How did we do that? We used side channels. In a side channel, for instance, in this example, uh, you probably have seen that in the movies, you have this uh, safe and when the latch snaps in, you hear this uh, snapping noise and you can hear that with a stethoscope and then you know that you have to turn the wheel the other direction and you know how to uh, open the safe. So what is a side channel? I would say a side channel is obtaining metadata and deriving secrets from it. And maybe some people don't agree with that, but this is a definition that I can work with. And in this case, in the case of drama, we also used a, a side channel, a timing side channel. So we used row hits and row misses because if you access DRAM cells, some of them will be cached in the row buffer and others are not. And you can see that this timing difference here, row hits, row misses. And uh, that's basically, we apply uh, methods from natural sciences, right? We uh, measure uh, whether it's faster or slower and infer something from that. And many people say, well, <laughs> that's not really science. Because if you take a look at how computer science should work or wh where computer science is, you can see here the branches of science and you can see basic and applied. You can see natural sciences, social sciences, formal sciences, and here we have computer science. Wait a second, computer science is a formal applied science? Um, also this guy here, computer science is just applied mathematics? Well, I'm not entirely sure about that, but applied mathematics. So maybe let's take a look at a actual computer and let's do some applied computations. So oh, we can type a number here. Yes, maybe this number. Oh, if we turn this around, this is from the other side. This is hello. This reminds me of something. Hello, so from, hello the other side. from the other side. I don't even need network rights. Your cache noise pattern, it clearly doesn't save your VM anymore. Wait a second, wait a second. They talked about noise. We are talking here about computers, applied formal science. This should be a fully deterministic system, right? So why do we have noise? This is from our uh, Hello from the Other Side paper, and you can clearly see that we observe noise. How can that be in a fully deterministic system? 
The thing is, there is no noise. Noise is just variables unaccounted for. So this means uh, we, are, we are not in a noisy system at all. But if we go back to these uh, questions like, is computer science just mathematics? Uh, I would say I would go a step further. Math is just applied philosophy. Well, if computer science is just mathematics, then probably this is also right. But this leads us to a very interesting question uh, that I've been wondering about. With endless computation power and knowledge of the entire state of the universe, I think one could predict the future. Well, yeah, maybe, maybe it's not possible. That's right. But the thing is, we have to... Uh, we have to accept that we build systems that are so complex that we are analyzing them with natural science methods because computer science, building things, exceeds what we can analyze with just formal methods. In this case, we also we probed the DRAM bus and inferred what the actual mappings are. In another case, we looked at address translation. So in this uh, case, we look at x86, 64, and we wanted to know whether the address translation, which has multiple layers, will take a different amount of time depending on where the translation stops. For instance, if you have a two megabyte page, it would already stop on this level and directly map a page, or for a four kilobyte page, it would stop on this level and directly provide a four kilobyte page. And if you look at the timing differences, you can see where, for instance, if you run this on the kernel addresses, uh, where the kernel addresses are mapped because the other parts, they stop at a higher timing, for instance, because the pages are not valid there. And this is, again, uh, science, right? We reverse engineered how this mapping works. And you might wonder, well, why don't you, this is stupid. Humans build it, so this must be documented somewhere. So why don't you just read the documentation, right? And the next step is, well, of course, this is not documented because it's not open source. So the question is, would open source solve the problem? Is Risk Five going to save the day? And the question that I want to ask you here is, did open source software save the day? It didn't. We see the same number of vulnerabilities in closed source software and in uh, open source software. The thing is, uh, there are some advantages to open source software. For instance, that it's usually a shorter amount of time until a bug is patched. Um, you also um, have probably a larger community that looks at the software, but you also have other disadvantages. For instance, as we have seen around Meltdown Inspector, that it's very difficult to patch very um, critical bugs out in the open. So there are advantages and disadvantages, and I think uh, <laughs> I don't have a clear answer to that in terms of security. Um, there's no clear uh, benefit other than the reduced uh, time to patch. Let's take another look uh, at one example, uh, because if you would say, well, open source isn't going to help, why don't we just make everything closed source and just hide all the ugly security hacks that we had? For instance, let's go for security by obscurity. And I have one example here. This is the MSR 0x150, and you can use this to select the voltage, as we did in the Plunder Vault attack. Um, and here you can see that you can select via this MSR, you can select the plane index and the offset and change the, the voltage of the CPU by that. This is, um, yeah, is this security critical? Is this security by obscurity? Let's take a look at this simple code here on an endless uh, loop. Uh, this should never terminate because it computes the same number over and over again and it should never go into this line. But if we take a look at this, um, when we run this code, Here you can see we are undervolting this now, and as we go down with the voltage, we see that a fault occurs, and this fault um, then can be exploited again, similar as in the Rohammer attack. So the question is, of course, if we are a formal science, if we are part of mathematics, can we just build provably secure systems? And a question that I want to ask you there is, what properties? 
before the internet came up, the properties that we wanted to have in a secure system were different than the properties that we want in them today. Today, we have these channels where um, criminals can send money over the internet. We have things like ransomware coming up that without the internet wouldn't flourish as much as they do. The internet radically changed what security properties we want in a system. Um, but this also exists on a much smaller scale with all the single new discoveries that we make. For instance, when we discover a hammer, we saw this patch in the Linux kernel, do not disclose physical addresses because of hammer. The problem here is that uh, no one would have foreseen that suddenly physical addresses would be considered a secret. So why would your formal system try to uh, keep this a secret if we don't even understand that this must be kept secret for another attack that was not even known at that point? So the required security properties change over time. If we take a look at the complexity of systems, the complexity of systems uh, is composed of the complexity of the subsystems that we have in there. So if we have this larger system, which is composed of three systems, then the complexity is at least as much as the complexity of the smaller subsystems. But we have not taken into account that we also have a system interaction here that adds additional complexity. So even if each of these systems by itself has a complexity where we can say we can make a formal proof, we can uh, reason about this system and argue why it is secure. As soon as we put multiple systems together, new effects occur that maybe are not covered by our security proofs. So if we take a look at, uh, for example, this case here, we have a user, we have an execution unit and a processor and the user says, I request or load data. And the execution unit will then in a second step check the privileges and then kill the user process or kill the threat if no privileges or if the user doesn't have enough privileges. This is one system, one interaction between two components. This is one system. Another system is this system here to obtain data. So we have the user on the one side that sends the request and the execution unit, because it doesn't have the data itself, will just send the request on to the cache and says, send the data to the requesting load. So send the data to the user and the cache will send this data to the user. So both uh, circuits, both, um, both cases, both systems by itself are secure. The right thing happens. But if you combine them, you will see that you have a race condition in the third step because the kill might occur just after the data was already received by the spy. So the question then is, of course, if we are building so complex systems that they have bugs like meltdown, is the solution maybe that we go back to more simple systems, less complex systems? And in general, I would say yes, to some extent we can. We have been doing that. For instance, the Pentium 4 was arguably a more complex design than the later core processors that um, went back to the Pentium 3 design as a basis. So now what we are doing there is we are combining more and more of these less complex designs into uh, larger and larger processors, larger and larger systems. And we at the same time make them smaller and smaller, which allows us to run these older, less complex systems at a higher frequency, at a higher speed. So Moore's law promises us that we can actually do that, that we can take simple cores and put them together into a um, system with multiple cores and each of these simple cores will run faster and faster and faster because we can um, put more uh, transistors into a small amount of space, we can run them at a lower uh, energy level and we can run them at a higher frequency. The problem now with Moore's law is it's ending. It's basically, we are very close to the end. Um, and uh, the problem is that if we take a look at our computation demands, I didn't find a plot for the computation demands of our entire uh, population, but I found an energy forecast of our computer systems. And here you can see that uh, the est current estimate is that by 2030, 
around 21% of electricity that we produce will be consumed by our computer systems. And this, of course, is a problem. This directly is correlated uh, to the uh, computation needs that we have. But if Moore's law is ending and at the same time we have a strong increase in the computation demands of our society, then the question is, how can we, how does that fit together? How can we uh, then still meet our computation demands? And the solution that I want to uh, bring up here is that, well, in 1999 we said, uh, oh, I developed one uh, piece of software in only 120 lines of code. And it's not so much about the lines of code that you write, but the lines of code that are involved in solving uh, the problem. Um, if you would take a look at the early 3D games or maybe uh, also consoles, they were heavily optimized for size and performance so that they can run on the constrained devices that they had at the time. By now, the systems, uh, due to Moore's law, um, scales so much up that it doesn't matter this much. So we now can write many things in a much more uh, wasteful uh, manner. But what I would predict in 2029, we might head back the other direction and start optimizing again for low level performance, for assembly, for C, um, because higher level languages might be too slow uh, or too energy consuming. So what we will have here, because of course writing low level code will have more uh, complex problems, synchronization problems, interaction with the low level um, parts, the operating system, the hardware. So yes, we will have more software complexity of one kind. Um, also, if you take a look at the hardware complexity, if Moore's law is ending, then I would expect that we have also a slowdown in the um, performance of modern processors. But if you take a look at, for instance, the CPU benchmarks, you see that the benchmark scores are actually increasing um, a bit above linear. The question is, how is that possible if Moore's law is ending? Because this shouldn't happen, right? It should slow down. The thing is, we are adding more and more optimizations on the microarchitectural level. And adding more optimizations on the microarchitectural level means more hardware complexity, more clever hardware, more instruction set extensions. And that means again, more potential for problems. We are combining more and more systems into single systems that um, are more difficult to understand. So if we take a look at the complexity of modern software or hardware, you can see that the software complexity uh, is almost reaching the level of uh, pretty complex biological organisms. The DNA sequence, the genome of a mouse, for instance. So our systems that we as humans build are getting so complex, getting as complex as nature itself. And there um, I want to bring up this book by Herbert Simon, The Sciences of the Artificial, because it is not a natural science to study how a computer works, because a computer is something artificial, something that we humans build. But we have to study it like nature because it exceeded the complexity that we can reason about in another way. So we have to study it like nature. And that means we have to go through the regular natural science methodology with question, hypothesis, prediction, then testing whether our prediction holds, and then the analysis of uh, the results. And then, of course, we also need to compare it with previous work, with related work, to see whether our hypothesis makes sense and whether our hypothesis might be correct. This is how our science works and our artificial science, where we study computers, works in the same way. Now, what is the conclusion here? Our systems are getting more and more complex and that means that we will have to I invest more and more time into studying them like nature. In 30 years, I would expect that we have a significantly larger number of people studying the um, security and analyzing the security of our systems than we have today. And if you take a look back 
uh, on 20 years ago, uh, 30 years ago, uh, the job of pen tester didn't really exist. So we have more and more security analysts and we will see more and more variety in the jobs that need to be performed there. So the takeaways are the complexity of hardware and software systems continues to increase. This does not stop and it cannot stop because we have our computational demands and at the same time Moore's law that is ending. We need natural science methods and significant efforts to understand systems and their complexity and their security. And the last uh, aspect that I want to give you is the perspective on security might change over time. We have seen that in the beginning, the internet changed the perspective on security, but also for very, very concrete attacks. For instance, for the meltdown attack, we thought the meltdown attack, that's it, it's solved. But only recently we figured out that we can also turn this around in a way and do something else. And with that, I will show you one last example. Is there a way we can do something like that? Uh, by injection inside or, or... And it turns out that the idea to do something with injection is not so bad. So here's our trailer, if you haven't seen it yet, for load value injection. There's one thing you should know about me. I specialize in a very specific type of security. Microarchitectural security. You're talking about meltdown. Mr. Van Burg has an idea he would like to discuss with you. Spotting meltdown? Not exactly. We turn meltdown around. You bring the subject into a fault and then they fill it with their secrets. And you break it and leak it. Well, it's not strictly speaking leaking. It's called load value injection. I think we overlooked one square. And this last square, that's LVI. We mustn't be afraid of the few male fences, darling. Thank you for your attention. Uh, now I will be available for the Q&A and I'm looking forward to any discussions on this topic. So see you in the Q&A in a second.